Hey guys, it's Zozo here and welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're new uh, Today I'm gonna be filming a video that I've been wanting to film for a very very long time uh, In fact, I've been trying to film for the whole day today But for some reason I just the moment this camera is on I cannot speak anymore So I'm gonna do my best I'm gonna try to get it right in one go and edit it tonight because i really want this video to be up by tomorrow i hope so if i can manage to pull through and just say what i have to say and get all the information out uh but yeah anyways um i have done a lot of research to be able to talk about whatever i'm going to talk about today uh but uh i remember all of it but sometimes for some reason i just tend to forget some dates or some important information that i know i just forget it for some reason so if you see me looking down on my notes i'm really sorry i'm just not used to using my brain that much recently but i'm gonna get used to it with time and i'm not gonna be looking at my notes i swear anyways without further ado i guess let's get started what i'm gonna be talking about today is a case that is just crazy i don't understand none of this makes sense this is a case that's unsolved to this day it's a case from the 80s 90s in uh melbourne i hope i'm saying that right australia uh, this is the case of Mr. Cruel, that, whose identity has not been found yet and I hope it will be found uh, as soon as possible, I guess. I'm just... I don't understand how this case has not been solved yet. It's just... There are some details that I'm gonna, that I'm gonna be sharing with you today that just... they don't make any sense. Like, it doesn't make sense. Like, how? But for some reason, I don't know. I'm just... I'm, I'm rambling, um, I'm gonna start from the beginning and I'm gonna try to be as clear as possible uh, with my information uh, Before starting the video, I just want to tell you guys that I don't mean any kind of disrespect with this video to the victims or the victims uh, family I, I, All my prayers go out for the families and I really... It, it really break, breaks my heart uh, to know about what has happened to them and i hope that no one has to go through what these families have gone through ever anyways let's get started mr cruel is believed to be responsible for about a dozen attacks on northeast melbourne during the 80s and 90s but he was only officially linked to four of these cases and i'm going to share with you uh how these were to happen in the facts of each and every single one of those cases because they deserve to be known and they deserve justice that has not been served yet to this day so everything started on the 22nd of august 1987 around 4 a.m when mr cruel was able to invade a house in melbourne australia by removing a pane of a window of their living room so he was able to enter the house and he went straight to the parents home he pointed a gun at the dad and woke him up and he threatened to shoot him if he didn't cooperate so at first um he told the parents that he was only there to rob them and that he was not going to kill them or shoot them if they cooperated with him and let him tie them up so obviously the parents they they accepted the let him tie tie them up and he he, yeah important information he tied them up with surgical tape that could be relevant later could be because we don't know but um yeah i will explain later but anyways he tied them up with surgical tape and he gagged them and put them inside of their wardrobes and closed the wardrobe then he headed to their younger son's bedroom and he did the exact same thing to him before heading to their daughter's bedroom and proceeding to assault her for the next two hours and mind you their daughter was 11 years old 11 during these 
these two hours where he proceeded to assault her he would sometimes walk around the house uh, go check if the parents had managed to uh, free themselves and he also went to make himself a meal in the middle in the middle of assaulting their kid which to me it just blows my mind like how do you just how do you just go i don't know to be honest this is just one of those details about the story they're just mind-blowing to me i don't understand this is terrifying uh, but anyways after the assault uh he used their phone and he, basically he was saying on the phone your kid is next bozo and then he just left the house uh, the parents were able to free themselves eventually and they contacted the police and the police obviously they checked everything and they discovered that he had never made any call from that phone he was just pretending so the police doesn't really know like does he actually think that he's talking to somebody on the phone because he has some sort some sort of mental illness or or is he just trying to scare the parents or is that a threat for the parents to go spread the word around that maybe other families are gonna be next i just even the police couldn't really tell because we don't know who that person is to this day so there's no way to confirm which of these assumptions is right but about a year later uh in december 1988 i believe um oh about the first family they chose to keep their privacy and they didn't want their names to be revealed which i absolutely understand but a year later mr cruel struck again and he around 5 30 or 5 40 a.m in the morning he uh managed to invade uh, another family's house uh this time it was the wills house uh so he did the exact same thing he went to the bathroom uh, to the parents bedroom where he pointed his gun at the mother and obviously the mother was just terrified for her children's sake so she she started screaming for her daughters to run and he told her that if she didn't stop screaming he would shoot her so the mom stopped and then he pointed the gun at the father and literally told him are you gonna try to be a hero and the father shook his head because he was terrified as anyone else would be so what he proceeded to do was to tie the parents up again and gag them with surgical tape and he then went to the daughter's bedroom where they slept in bunk beds and he called one of the four daughters sharon wills by her first name he he called her he was like sharon like i know you're not sleeping come on sharon and it's just scary to know that he actually had information about this family which we could assume that he was talking them where he knew about them from somewhere to to know the, the name of the kid that he was going to later on kidnap um so he basically called the the daughter he was like sharon sharon and uh he asked her to go get some of her clothes and he told the family that he was only going to steal money and then leave but um that turned out not to be true because he ended up taking sharon with him and leaving and not taking any money so the parents um managed to free themselves after some time and they went to check on their daughters and they not noticed that uh sharon was not there so they thought maybe she ran away when the mother was screaming but as they went looking she was nowhere so they tried to use their phone to call the police but he had cut their phone lines before leaving so they went to see their neighbors they asked them if they could use their phone they called the police the police came over uh the police looked for hours and hours they did everything they could do but there was no sign of sharon and after 18 or 16 hours i'm sorry i'm not sure i think it was 18 hours after about 18 hours um there was a person uh going home around midnight and she found this little girl on the street just walking by herself wearing a bunch of garbage bags and so 
that person called the police and alerted them she that person was like oh there's this girl walk walking by herself maybe it's sharon you should definitely come and check and so the police did just that and in fact it was sharon and what she had told the police was that uh he told her not to remove her blindfold because her his freedom was more important than her life and then he would kill her if she removed if she removed the, the blindfold and um, she also told the police that uh, when he wasn't looking she did remove her blindfold for a second which is very very brave of her to do and she was able to give them a description of the bedroom and the bathroom which would later be released uh, years and years later uh, she also told them that he pretended like they were married and he would call her Missy and obviously he did uh, assault her sexually I mean uh, then the, the, the police released the kid to go back to uh, her parents and um, and what had happened uh, did so much damage to that family that they said that after their daughter was back none of them could sleep in their own bedrooms and they spent months after the attack all sleeping together in the living room because they couldn't bear the idea of being separated each in their own room they increased the security of their house of their house and they even got a protection dog to to just to protect the family as an extra measure which i absolutely totally understand then on about over way over a year later um in july on july 3rd 1990 there was the third attack of Mr. Crew and this time it was the Linus family. So this family is not originally from Australia It's a family from the UK and they had come to Australia for a couple of years for the dad's work and uh, When ha this took place, they were just a couple of days away from going back to the UK They had packed their bags. They were ready. They, they were they were about to go and on that night, on the 3rd of July, uh, the colleagues of the parents had invited them to sort of like a farewell party in their honor since they were leaving and their colleagues were just down the street and the parents weren't able to get a babysitter and so uh, they ended up leaving their children at home, uh, Fiona and Nicholas, both, of, both um, respectively 15 and 13 years old and so the parents weren't planning on staying for that long and it was really close to where they lived so they assumed that nothing would go wrong they locked the doors and they left and so around i want to say 11 30 that night 11 30 p.m um the mr cruel managed to invade the house again i think this time it was from the back door but i'm not exactly sure he managed to inv uh, invade the house and he tied up fiona the older sister and then he called nicholas by her name and he told her to go get her school uniform and to come and that he just wanted money so Nicholas did just that she went ahead and she got her school uniform and she came back to him and then he told Fiona that if they wanted Nicholas back then the parents would have to pay him $25,000 and they left they took the, the parents rental car and then they took off and so when the parents came back they find their they found their daughter uh tied up to the bed so they, they they helped her free herself and then they asked her about what had happened and she was talking about this man in a ski mask and a blue overalls and she told them that he just wanted money he wanted twenty five thousand dollars for their daughter fiona to be freed so the parents held a press conference and they told the Mr. Cruel directly that they had no problem paying the ransom, they would pay anything, they just wanted their daughter back. So, and the police kept looking and looking and looking, they did everything they could do, but still no signs of Nicholas. So the parents were, were getting increasingly worried, I mean, obviously, 
And so 36 hours after her kidnapping, the parents held another press conference where they begged even more. They were more frantic. They were more worried as any parents would be for their daughter to be back safely. And yeah, nothing. The police could not find her. No signs of uh, Mr. Cruel until on her 14th birthday and 50 hours after she had been kidnapped, uh, she someone found her or she had found someone and asked them to use their phone she told the police that mr Crowell had dropped her off and he had told her not to move from her position and to count to a certain number otherwise he would kill her and it's probably because he didn't want her to see his face um until he he ran away and that's what she did she told the police that she had counted to that uh, number and then she found somebody and asked if she, and asked if she could use their phone to call her parents and so the, but the police were interrogating her obviously to be able to to learn more information and um she was able to tell them that he had reddish brown hair he was around six foot eight and um and she also told them that she could hear the sound of airplanes like low as if they were really close so the police were and another one of his victims the first one was able to tell them that exact same information so the police uh were suspecting that he lived close to the airport so the police were suspecting that he lived uh near the airport and so the family were able to be reunited with with their daughter and uh, they moved back to to the uk on i believe the 13th of april 1991 was the last known case of mr cruel when this time he targeted the chan family so basically the chan family consisted of the two parents um and uh, their three daughters Carmen, Carly and Karen and uh, the thing the, the thing that's particular about this family is that the parents uh, they had immigrated to Australia and they owned two restaurants their parents were super hardworking. they worked 15 to 18 hours a day to be able to provide a good future for their daughters uh, so uh, oftentimes they were not at home they were working at their restaurants to be able to make a living and the daughters would have to stay by them by themselves at home but they were used to it they never had any kind of problem with that and it was often Carmen the 13 year old and eldest daughter that kind of took care of the other younger of her younger siblings uh, it said that she had the TV in her room and they would all gather there and watch TV together uh and that day on april 1991 it said that the two younger daughters uh went downstairs to kind of make something for dinner or get a snack uh to bring it back up and that's when at around 9 15 or 9 30 p.m uh mr cruel found them and he led them back upstairs where the elder sister was and he tied the youngest sisters and put them in the their wardrobe and then uh i don't know how he managed to do it but i think he pushed something against the ward uh, the wardrobe doors so that they weren't able to leave but he told them that he was only after the the money and the valuables in their home i'm sorry about the noise i don't know if you can hear it but uh yeah, I, I have uh, some sort of problem with my fridge at the moment and so it's really noisy. I hope it's not going to be too much of a problem for the rest of the video and I'm gonna try to get that fixed by next time. But pretty much um, he told uh, the younger sisters that he was only after the valuables and that he was not going to hurt them and that he was going to ask Carmen to show him where the valuables were. So that's what the sisters were thinking, like, okay, Carmen is going to show him where everything is and then they're going to come back and free us. But that's not what happened at all because he had gone, he had kidnapped Carmen, he had took her and left and left the sisters there. The sisters managed to get out somehow and then they called their parents, they called for help um and um yes the parents came back they contacted the police and the particularity with this attack was that he had written on their car asian drug deal more to come or something like that and so it was also a possibility for the the police that uh, it could not be mr cruel and it could be something that had 
that had something to do with their restaurant maybe they were selling drugs or i don't know and so there was another lead which which is not a good thing because it's a waste of money and er energy to pursue another lead uh, and that's probably what Mr. Cruel had intended for since the beginning and so the parents held a press conference to be able to kind of clear up this whole drug thing um, and uh, get people to actually help them find their daughter and it's just it's really heartbreaking i saw some snippets i didn't watch all of it but i, I saw parts of it and it's just it broke my heart the, the mom was so frantic and the way she spoke about her daughter she was just begging for her daughter to be back and it's just it's heartbreaking and so days and days and days go by and still nothing no information about carmen nothing she was not found the parents say that they would pay anything they even wrote out letters uh, they to to carmen they they put something in the newspaper that only carmen could be able to identify i'm not exactly sure what it was but they really did everything they could and still nothing no nothing no signs of carmen nothing and so time went by and about a year later in the exact same month on the 9th of april 1992 there was a man uh walking his dog near a river i believe and they they discovered this call of what we know now was um carmen and so they called the police and um, the police found her remains and uh, yeah that was so much strain on the family that the parents ended up getting a divorce and the mom even lost the house lost her car lost so many things and um, yeah it was just devastating and Th this case was different from the others because he actually ended up killing his victim which he had never done before and so there were a lot of questions and speculations about this but uh, I think that it all kind of boiled down to the fact that uh, Carmen was known uh, to be more stubborn than the other kids she was not the kind of kid that was really obedient and would just follow what anybody would ask her to do she would definitely fight back if she didn't want to do something and that's what people speculate was the cause of her death because she didn't want to obey maybe she had seen his face or she didn't want to keep her blindfold and yeah people speculate that this was the reason that she ended up dead and that uh, mr cruel felt remorseful and that's why he stopped kidnapping kids and taking them away um throughout all of these cases there were some more uh information that uh maybe i should mention uh one of the victims had said that she saw a tripod and a camera in the room so there's this speculation that he was recording it was it to sell it or for his own personal use either way it's disgusting it's nasty but yeah it's a speculation and it's very likely that that's what he did and um there's uh, also the other victim nicholas that was uh kidnapped for 50 hours that said that her her neck was tied down to the bed and she couldn't move she couldn't see anything for the whole time because she she couldn't her neck was just tied to the mattress she couldn't do anything about it there are a lot of speculations when it comes to the identity of mr cruel uh for every each and every single one of his victims before he let them go he would make them take a bath he would clean under their nails he would cut their fingernails and their toenails he would brush their teeth multiple times and floss their teeth so much until the last moment that they let them go and because of that there was the speculation of is mr cruel a dentist because it's really weird to be so meticulous about flossing if it's about dna well there's other places that that there could be dna evidence I mean why does he floss their teeth so much it, it was kind of weird um, but uh, yeah uh, other people think that maybe he was uh, somehow related to 
their schools or or I, we don't really know but there are a lot of people that think that maybe he's a teacher or he's a bus driver or something like this because uh, Nicholas and Carmen were a part of the same school or school district I believe so there's that speculation and he also knew them by name and he asked for them to take their uniforms so with that comes the question of is he a part of the school system or is it just a coincidence because he had been stalking them or or what how does he pick those girls uh, a lot of other people think that he's definitely in the law enforcement or somehow related to it or the military because he never left any kind of forensic evidence none nothing the, the police couldn't find anything well they, there was a, a little piece of surgical tape that was left that's, but at the time the police couldn't really test for DNA because that was not really oh, an option back then but now it's definitely possible and there was but even even though there was not really that technology back then he was really careful not to leave any forensic evidence which definitely makes you wonder if he was a part of the police or how did he know so much about forensic about dna um but there was only one piece of evidence that could have had dna and it was a piece of surgical tape um but we'll talk about that later we'll leave that for later after carmen was kidnapped the police kind of opened a task force that they called spectrum to uh find carmen and to 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 work on finding who mr Kroll was and that start task force i think consistent consisted of around 40 people they searched around uh 30 000 houses uh to try to find Mr. Cruel and in those 30,000 houses there were 70 convictions of people that had CP which is disgusting but at least they were convicted I just that's an astronomical number received about 10,000 tips and they were and they interviewed about over 27,000 people so that's really huge but uh, after Carmen's remains were discovered, uh, they just, that task force didn't lead anywhere, so it just stopped. I the police even gave out a reward of $300,000 to anyone who would be able to give them a lead on Mr. Cruel, and nothing ever came out of that. So in 2010, a new police task force uh, came over, uh, the Apollo task force, I believe, and they had one piece that could potentially have DNA evidence and it was a piece of surgical tape, the one that I had talked about before uh, but, but for some reason it has just disappeared when they wanted to analyze it, there was nothing, it disappeared the piece of evidence, the only piece of evidence that could have had his DNA just disappeared nobody knew where it was, it just ran away, it just left so that's why there's a lot of speculation that Mr. Cruel could be a member of the law enforcement on the 25th birthday of um, uh, Carmen Chan's disappearance. Uh, they, the police even gave out a reward of over one million dollar to whoever would be able to give them a lead. But all that also just was a dead end. There's nothing that came out of it. Nothing. Um, to this day that uh, person that criminal has never been found a lot of people speculate there's this huge th theory that uh, mr. cruel could be the golden state killer that I also want to talk about eventually but that uh, case just terrifies me so I, I just need some time before I'm able to talk about that case uh a lot of people speculate that they could have been the same person um i don't really think so but uh yeah it's because around the time that the golden state killer had stopped his crimes um in california was around the the same uh time period that uh 
Mr. Cruel was active in Australia. But the thing is, even though they had the same ammo in, a, in the sense that both of them went uh, to make themselves a sandwich or I don't know what they were making themselves in the houses of the people that they uh, assaulted or killed or things like that, um, they, it's, their crimes are just too different for me to think that they're the same person. Uh, the Golden State Killer left DNA evidence here and there, whereas uh, Mr. Cruel seemed like he was really a clean freak, I'd say. Like he was really meticulous about cleaning everything, not leaving any any piece of DNA anywhere so I for that reason I don't really think they're the same person there's also someone that I think is worth mentioning so the police had multiple suspects but there was one of the suspects whose name is wait let me just well, his name was Brian L or I'm probably butchering that I'm so sorry I think he worked in a university he had written an article that was super popular and everything but he was arrested because he had um, made attacks against against six women and little girls between 1972 and 1973 and so he he pled guilty to rape and to more because he attacked them with a knife and threatened them then raped them uh, so he was sentenced to 10 years in prison for his crimes which I, I don't think 10 years is enough to be honest but anyways he was sentenced to 10 years in prison and when he was released shortly after the whole Mr. Cruel attacks started happening so a lot of people started speculating that maybe it could have been that brian uh guy but um he strongly denied it and he said that he had nothing to do with it and there was really no evidence to link him to the crime scenes or anything so yeah that lead uh led nowhere clearly yeah um so no charges were ever made against him uh, and yeah I feel so tired just talking about this story and I skipped a lot of the details so if you guys would like to know the details of each and every single case then let me know uh, and if this format is good for you then let me know that too and if you would like them to be shorter and less details then please let me know that too my heart goes out to each and every single member of the victim's family I'm sorry if I said any names wrong or if I didn't give the information out as complete as possible. Please feel free to leave any kind of constructive criticism uh, in the comments and let me know if there are any cases that you would like me to, to talk about in the future. And yeah, I'll see you guys later. Bye!